You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. It's not very often that you get five professional women of African heritage in one room, in one space. And just sitting around this table of five amazing women, being able to amplify our voices and amplify our successes and be given a platform, I think is really critical in showcasing what the African continent has to offer. And it's also about supporting each other and supporting other people out there who are looking for a forum to just really engage and network and create conversations. We're already becoming those cultural ambassadors in the way that we carry ourselves, in the way that we speak about Africa. Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the Unlocking Africa podcast, where we find amazing people who are doing amazing things to unlock Africa's economic potential. Today, we have special guests. We have five off the cuff, who are a collective of powerful professional African women who are doing great things in their own sectors, businesses, industries. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast. Five off the cuff, how are you? We're good, thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Brilliant, brilliant. (laughs) So as you know, this is the first time I've had the pleasure of interviewing five people at the same time. So it's an absolute honour. I'm excited and looking forward to which direction today's conversation (laughs) goes. I'm not sure if you've listened to the podcast before, but I usually like to start from the beginning. So if you could please introduce yourselves, if we go first with Precious. Hi, Tessa. Wonderful to be on your podcast today. My name is Precious Zumbika Luanga, and I am one of five of the cuff. And I'm a business owner. Um, I'm a construction advisor, construction expert, a businesswoman, business strategist. And I love all things Africa. So I'm really grateful to be on this podcast today with my fellow Five of the Cuff ladies. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. If we can go next to Elizabeth Shaw. Hey, hi, everyone. Good to be here. Great, actually, to be here. Um, founder of A Thousand Black Voices, uh, where we were redefining the startup ecosystem, uh, judge with the British Business Awards, featured in Forbes, uh, a number of uh, awards. But generally, it's all about giving you advice. So I'm just really pleased to be here today and really being able to support in that. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And next, we have Edith. Hi, everyone. Um, really excited to be here with my fellow Five of the Cup ladies. Um, I'm Edith Udemeswe. I've spent the last 25 years or so um, in talent acquisition, specifically within the life sciences sector, hiring mid to senior management individuals for my clients. Um, I work for a global organizational consultancy, and I have a particular interest in mentoring and developing underrepresented talent. So, yeah, excited to be here. Fantastic. And next we have Elizabeth. Hi there. Excited to be here too. And one of the five of the cup. Really excited. Um, I'm Elizabeth Anyebna. I am a co-founder of a marketing media agency called 16 by 9, um, which does all the planning and buying for clients. So basically get your voice out there. When I'm not doing my day job, I do a lot in the mentoring and supporting of women in the marketing and communication space. So I'm president of a network called Bloom, as well as umpteen other things that I do, as well as everybody else does in our space when it comes to supporting us as people of colour and definitely those with African heritage like my fellow sisters here. So I'm really pleased to be on this podcast. Next, we have Shalom. I've left Shalom to last because you were actually the first person ever on this podcast. So it's good to have you back on. (laughs) Thank you for having me, Tess. And it's great to be here at Five Off The Cuff. Um, 
I'm so curious as to how you're going to handle five women. This is just going to be so interesting. I'm Shalom <laughs> Lloyd. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a scientist. I have two companies, Naturally Tribal and also Emerging Market Quality Trials. And I am a director of a couple of businesses uh, based in Nigeria. So all roads seem to lead to Africa for me. Really excited about this. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So if we go with five off the cuff, how did the collective come about? How did you get together? And I guess, what is it that you're trying to achieve as a collective? It's not very often really that you get five professional women, Black women of African heritage who have so many similarities in one room, in one space. We're first of all friends before five off the cuff. And I think from the conversations that we were having, fair enough, over a glass of wine, um, we kind of thought, oh, my goodness, there is really something in this, something we can do, something we can do to help, first of all, ourselves. And then everybody else out there, particularly women, we can tap into our due heritage. We just felt there was something special and a thread that ran through all of us. Uh, we come from different business sectors. Some of them overlap, some of them don't. And five off the cuff is really us having meaningful conversations, sometimes not so meaningful, but relevant conversations <laughs> and actually injecting our different ideas. But again, always with the same shared values, shared ethos. And um, we kind of thought there's nothing out there quite like this. So there you have us, Tessa. Fantastic. As you mentioned, Five Off The Cuff is something different. It's something new. You've come together quite organically. In terms of what you're aiming to do in the business world, do you have any projects, any activities that you're collectively working on? Or is it more of a, like a peer-to-peer -peer network, engaging, supporting each other? I think it's a mixture of things. So, you know, there are certainly a couple of projects that we are thinking about and refining. Um, and it's also about supporting each other and supporting other people out there who are looking for a forum to just really engage and network and create space and create conversation. So we're still crafting it all out, still thrashing it all out. And um, we've got a couple of ideas on the table. So um, you'll certainly be hearing more about those in the future. But I guess, you know, it's really about having an opportunity for us to connect as individuals. As Shalom said, and as you highlighted, we met and connected really quite organically. Some of us have known each other since, um, well, I won't say how long, but certainly an incredibly long time. Um, other, you know, others are, you know, we've connected over the last couple of years and it's just been an amazing experience. And we've really tapped into what each of us bring to the table with our businesses and the organizations that we work with. And what we're looking to do is to really consolidate all of that into a real experience, not just for us, but for the audiences that we're going to be engaging with. But as we say, you're going to be hearing a lot more about that in the coming months. I look forward to that. I look forward to that. So as you know, on the podcast, I usually interview people who are doing work directly in Africa, but we've decided to do something different today. Interview Africans in the diaspora who are doing amazing things. And I'd like to get your perspective regarding how the success of the African diaspora has maybe not a direct impact, but does have an impact on the continent in terms of how it's perceived, how people engage. What are your thoughts on that? So just on that, I think that there's a narrative around, you know, what success looks like for Africans that live and work in the United Kingdom. At the end of the day, we are a representation of the continent to an extent. So I think that there's a, a responsibility on our shoulders inadvertently to showcase our talent and just sitting around this table of five amazing women, being able to amplify our voices and amplify our successes and be given a platform, I think is really critical in showcasing what the African continent has to offer. Now, when we're looking back into what the continent itself perceives of us, I think there is a narrative that is changing. Um, there's a, an, an incredible narrative that is changing in terms of what Africa has to offer. 
And we are showcasing that talent and actually tapping into, Shalom mentioned that all roads lead to Africa. Absolutely. Africa is a continent that is having a different light shed on it. And we are the voices of Africa in this United Kingdom. And actually, I think that there's a responsibility with our counterparts, our brothers and sisters in the continent, to create a conduit that supports that amplification of African talent. And this is what we're trying to do. Amazing. If I could just add in there, Teresa, the fact that I'm proud to be a diaspora. I'm proud to be African. Africa is an emerging market. It's forecasted, I think, to grow three times faster than developed economies. Um, the, the huge market potential um, is there. By 2050, I think it is, Africa will house over a third of the world's population. So this is a continent that can't be ignored. We are everywhere. Mm. And if you're in any country in the world and there's no African <laughs> leave <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean I, i'm just going to add on when you're talking about that from an investment and entrepreneurship perspective that actually african companies in startups are the only ones that really have an increase in investment going into africa every other continent has had a decrease in the uh, amount and number of investments being made so that really goes to show you that there is so much innovation so much um, talent in Africa and um, the money's pouring in. So let it continue. Fantastic. Thank you for that. As diasporans, do you believe that there is a need to actually be in Africa to unlock some of that potential or can we do it from afar? I think that there's ways of actually unlocking Africa. I mean, I'll speak for myself and a couple of the ladies on the call at the moment. Where you are placed geographically doesn't stop you unlocking Africa. One of the businesses that I have, which is Perspective Limited, is focusing on actually raising the voice and changing those narratives of doing business in Africa. Um, Shalom will speak for herself. Her business, she talked about the fact that she's got a number of businesses in Nigeria and she operates across the continent. I won't blow her thunder right now. I'll let her speak about it. It doesn't really matter where you are. It's really about what you're doing. It's really about how you're activating that change. So for me, being based in the United Kingdom is not stopping me building those relationships, raising the profile of Africa and continuously engaging. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of challenges that you face in terms of that. But actually, it's really about your intention. My intention is to continuously build those bridges. I may have worked in the United Kingdom for 23 years, but at the end of the day, I'm a Zimbabwean born woman. I was born in Zimbabwe. I understand the landscape. And that puts me a little bit above the, the fence than people that have never worked and engaged in Africa. So the responsibility as a diaspora and absolutely is on my shoulders. But is it a barrier working and living in the United Kingdom? Absolutely not. Oh, I disagree, Precious. I think you've got to be on ground to make it happen in Africa. Africa is VUCA. Africa is volatile, is uncertain, it's complex, is ambiguous. And I'm, I agree. Honestly, I had the mentality that I could do a lot from here by having talent on the ground, but I realized that, you know, culture plays a huge role here. For me, the type of businesses that I have, I realized I had to make the investment and actually be on ground as often as possible because there's still a lot of Wahala in Africa. I mean, I kind of like, um, I agree with you both. I think we're unlocking the potential of Africa by actually just being here and being mm -hmm. African and having that connection to the continent because we are representing. As Africans, we are always showing up and we've always been showing up. You know, individuals have been successful individuals of African heritage who've been in this country from day dot. Well, maybe not from day dot, but you know what I mean? So yeah. I think that we're now getting the visibility. People are seeing the potential. And we are, through that, unlocking that potential in Africa because people are visualizing us as being that example or role model or, you know, however you want to call it. And, and yes, absolutely agree with you, Shalom, that, you know, for certain things, you need to be on the ground. You need to understand the economic climate, the political climates. Each country is different. You know, Africa is a continent. We're not talking about the one country. specific. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's a combination combination of the two. You can unlock the potential somewhat by not being there, but infinitely, you, I think that when it comes to businesses and, and getting those businesses off the ground and dealing with locals and all of that, you, you need to have some sort of a presence there too. 
Well, if I just um, jump in, definitely I can do huge amounts not being physically resident in Africa or being there. You know, really, when you're thinking about first-hand experiences, though, and opportunities to engage, there needs to be some sort of presence there. But we are bringing together founders from across the um, African continent and other locations globally, and we're able to support and develop talent, but also develop their businesses um, and support them and engage and connect them to capital in different locations. So there is that side of things, and we're doing that virtually. The other side of things, though, is having people on the ground there to be able to do outreach. And that's something that we're engaging in. We can we do that through various different communities, uh, other accelerators, universities, because they understand the cultural barriers, the challenges that are being faced on the ground. And that is really key and important. You know, how do people actually access? So having those uh, various different uh, aspects incorporated into how we engage in Africa, I think is really important. And we being out in the diaspora, acting as cultural ambassadors, promoting culture in Africa, heritage, I think is something that we do engage with every day just by being here. I love that cultural ambassadors. Yeah, that's exactly right. I was thinking really more about, I don't think it's an either or, a sort of a a mesh of both or, or a hybrid. We've just got all our roles, you know, whether we are based in the UK or anywhere really uh, globally or whether we are in Africa, you know, physically. Um, I do think, though, there is a need for authenticity. So even though we are here, we have to still be on ground to be able to put context to anything we do here. You know, otherwise we're talking in a more theoretical manner, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean we need to live there but we definitely need to understand firsthand what it is that we're doing. Otherwise, we're talking at. I think the other thing as well is Africa as a continent is 100% a a place that everyone scrambles for, as you know. There's obviously the scramble of Africa that happened and is still happening, you know. And so we need to kind of, I suppose, own that diaspora here, you know, i.e. we are here doing stuff as an African Um, whether it's African heritage or owning it, because we represent, right? So we're here in the African diaspora doing stuff as people with African heritage who are Africans doing, you know, and achieving things, as well as what's happening in Africa, because it benefits either way. And as Elizabeth Shaw sort of said, sort of representing. So when you've got a perception here that may be wrong or needs challenging, we're here to kind of challenge that for those brothers and sisters out in the continent who can't otherwise do that. So, yeah, it's about what what that means. It's not an either or. We're all kind of all in it together doing our bit as Africans. Brilliant, brilliant. I have to say, I agree with both perspectives, so I'm sitting firmly on the fence. Of course you are. (laughs) You're the host. (laughs) As Precious mentioned, what matters is what you're doing. So if we look at that in more detail... In what ways, in terms of activities, do you believe Africans outside of the continent in the diaspora can actively contribute to Africa's, say, image or power on the global stage? Yes, I would say we're, we're contributing already uh, from a diaspora perspective. The diaspora is extremely powerful. You know, uh, we contribute to Africa's GDP in a whole in terms of investment, in terms of money that is sent back home in terms of transferring skills, starting businesses, knowledge, um, developing people, etc. I think it's from, uh, um, I don't know if it's the World Bank or, or whatever, but in, in 2020, I think it was over uh, 80 to 90 billion that yes. was sent to um, um, within Africa by the diaspora. That is huge, in my opinion. And, you know, more and more, I'm finding that these days, and i um, not ashamed to say this, as the years go by, I'm finding that I'm prouder and prouder to actually shout out about my African heritage, more so than I was in the past. And that's been completely honest and transparent. I'm now really proud to sort of stand up there and say, yes, I'm African British or British African, whichever one comes first, depending on the situation I find myself in, right? Um, so, yeah, I think we, we contribute significantly already. 
I'd like to add to that, actually, and I'll pull the point that Elizabeth Shaw said about cultural ambassadors. You know, sometimes seeing and understanding and actually having people that break down the landscape is really important. I think there's something around what we can do. So Shalom's talking about economic contribution, but there's also a cultural contribution that we are already doing within the United Kingdom or in any space where diasporans are living across the globe. So there's an element of that. We're constantly showcasing who we are. And as we grow older, there's the whole Africanism movement that's going on. We're starting to embrace the way we dress, the way we carry our hair, the way we look. Visibly, we are becoming more and more, you know, more visible in society. So already, I think there's a movement in terms of Africa or Black is Beautiful, whatever you want to call it. The cultural mix, that whole melting pot of different dress, different wear, different hair, et cetera, is something that we're already doing. And sometimes it can be a burden, but it's something that I think as we're growing older or wiser, whatever you want to call it, we're more and more comfortable. So there's already an, uh, an expectation that in the diaspora, we're already becoming those cultural ambassadors in the way that we carry ourselves, in the way that we speak about Africa, in the way that we break down some of those expectations or even a, an unknown assumptions about what Africa is so i just thought i'd add on that cultural aspect fantastic thank you anyone else want to add to that what i was sort of thinking really is i think there's been a bit of a shift you know and i can't remember which one i sort of said about all roads lead to africa and i kind of think that's true certainly in the uk where you kind of talk africa then you talk the caribbean and then you talk all this and more and more, I guess, I don't know whether it's the lockdown, the pandemic, or, you know, what's happened in 2020, that sort of made people kind of really think about, well, us as Africans broadly, you know, and recognising where we kind of all come from, and a certain sort of pride, you know, not that it wasn't before, but sort of like really owning it, you know, and that means that sort of when we're doing something here, we're representing as opposed to doing something as a British person only, you know. And my only thing, and I don't know whether you will come on to this or not, is I sort of referenced the, the scramble for Africa because that was a thing, certainly when the colonised were, um, you know, became independent in quotes because, of course, we're still battling. I mean, is that there is a recognition that Africa has a lot of value. And that recognition is certainly registered by non-Africans who are piling in investment in different forms. There needs to be a standing up and a recognition by Africans, for Africans, whether we're in the diaspora or actually physically there, to do our bit for ourselves. Because you do have, I don't know, that potential for appropriation or, you know, the intention may not be necessarily as we would like to sort of um, want it to be, right? So the scramble for Africa is real. And I think the more that we as Africans do our bit when we're investing within Africa as Africans for ourselves, as opposed to looking outward, you know, the better, you know, because I feel that that is real too. I have to go back and reference the by Africans for Africans that you just mentioned there, Elizabeth. And that is, that is something that's really challenging and difficult because it's back to, you know, to what you were saying about, first of all, responsibility and accountability and weight of that actually on our shoulders, that sometimes the expectation that we in the diaspora have to do something, we want to do something, but we have to do something. And also our accountability, all Africans' accountability and to make sure that we take charge of what is rightfully ours as a continent, as a community. And there's so much value there that we know, but do we actually believe always in ourselves? So, you know, we have got to value our knowledge and skill sets, how we can transfer that into the diaspora, how we can actually ensure that we enhance Africa's power and back to, you know, the cultural exchange and understanding. So I think there's so much there that we still need to appreciate ourselves, that we are actually should be the drivers of our destinies and the, the driver of change and mm -hmm. uh, really stop this appropriation that's still going on within our continent. Well, yeah, that's uh, because of the, not in totally, because we can't be blameless, of course, but um, you have had years of conditioning. You know, we're having to unpick years and years, decades of that sort of conditioning about how we approach things, how we sort of see Africa 
and how Africans value how we value ourselves, right? So we're having to kind of unpick years and years of being positioned as not having the same sort of value or not able to maybe represent ourselves or, you know, contribute um, in that way. And so looking outwards as a result or the perception of what we even have with regards to what Africa actually is, right? You know, so we're having to unpick and deal with that from, I mean, you know, you could talk colonization, you could talk slave trade. I mean, this is sort of years and years of that, right? We're having to sort of recalibrate mm-hmm. how we think. Um, I'm not saying that that is the legacy that stays there and then we sort of sit with it, but there is a legacy there that we have to kind of move on from, but understand that, that it is there and it's it's really deeply rooted. You know, I feel there are shifts now. You know, we're more we're embracing ourselves, coming together and so on. It's just going to take a lot of time to get to where we need to get to. I agree. And I think that, I mean, I sometimes have quite a simplistic view about it, about it all being about partnership, partnership between those of us out here in the diaspora and also those of us who are living on the continent. You know, when I look at, for instance, what Shalom's doing with her business, Naturally Tribal, and actually working with the women there in Nigeria to produce your wonderful products. And I think that we need more of that. We just need more of that sort of like coming together, working together. There's a real force of nature that the continent could be even more so than it is now if we can get that partnership approach right. And that's why I say I come at it with quite a simplistic perspective because I know that that's not easy, right? I know that that's a massive challenge and every country has its own dynamics. Um, You know, every country is different, but there is something, you know, if we could get that unification, that true unification of the diaspora with those of us who are on the continent, I think that that we'll have an insurmountable power, legacy, force, you know, whatever you want to call it, to really drive through and create even more of an impact that we are doing today. I mean, we have amazing talent, we know, in Africa. We have amazing talent, you know, in the diaspora. And um, there just needs to be that coming together, you know, of everything. And I know it's very simplistic. Um, and I'll go back in my box right now because I'm sure there are going to be <laughs> lots of different, um, you know, comments around, well, you know, how is that going to be possible? You know, we've tried this. This is happening here, you know. But I, th- I think that there is something there. I think there is something, if we could get that force to come together, then um, if you look at, you know, our culture, our music, you know, uh, whether it's the arts, the sciences, you know, whatever, everyone is tapping into that. Mm-hmm. We yes. have something. Everybody is tapping into all aspects of what makes us unique in the different countries. And we're taking more and more control of that now. I mean, absolutely. You know, when did when did Afrobeats actually become so prevalent and out there and everybody's so engaged with it? It's only really within the last few years. And there's been a massive wave. I mean, if we could do that with Afrobeats, think about what we could do with tech and science, of which we are actually already making inroads into, yeah, right? Um, business, you know, but we can really create this massive wave. I love that we call it Afrobeat. Was it always called yeah. Afrobeat? I don't recall it being Afrobeat all the time till it became um, a popular thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you mentioned something earlier on that resonated, and I think it's really around that whole upskilling piece, right? It's not simplistic, actually. I don't think it's complicated. I think it is actually what you said, simplistic. So an example, COVID brought in a complete, shall I mention VUCA, right? COVID disrupted globally. What is stopping us at the moment actually engaging with talent in Africa within our own businesses? Everybody's working on a virtual platform, potentially. Not not, not all businesses can take it. I'll speak about my own business, where it's consultancy services, for example. There's nothing absolutely stopping me. And I'll say right now, the engagement with some of the talent in Africa has been absolutely tremendous. I'm sure around the table, people have used Upwork, they've used Fiverr, they've used all those different platforms where you can engage with talent regardless of where they are in the geographical makeup and actually bring them in and weave them in and actually give them a sense or a taste of how to do business outside of their own location. So for me, I think actually going back to simplistic, to an extent, possibly, it becomes difficult where you're starting to produce product, for example, where something is quite tangible. You need to have 
staff or, 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 or employees in a specific location. But actually, the challenge is out there. There is talent in Africa. Are we tapping into it with our businesses? That are, are we actually creating that relationship and that partnership that you mentioned? I think there's a place for it. Absolutely, there's a place for it. There's a few things, Precious, that you I mean, I'm, I'm so loving this conversation because, you know what? Everything that we just talked about is happening now. And I think the problem is that we're not seeing it being shown. We're not seeing it. I know businesses who have opened offices across Africa. You know, when there was a whole drive about people opening call centers in India, here, there and everywhere. Um, with all the tech and digital boom happening at the moment, Africa is becoming a tech hub. So things are really mm -hmm. happening. The middle class in Africa are growing. They have disposable income. In fact, some of them don't even want to come to like, you know, before coming to the UK, to the States for holiday. Um, some of them see us as diaspora. You are like, they're suffering. You know what I mean? <laughs> the mindset is really, really changing. And I'll tell you why I think it. I think it's also because if you look at this continent of ours called Africa, I think it has the youngest population in the world. When you look at all other continents and countries, you say, well, the aging population is growing. Africa is the opposite. So you have young people, you have resources. In this day and age, young people are so far ahead than where we were. And then let's bring it back to five off the cuff, right? Let's look at these women. The opportunity is now. The five of us come, come from different industries. What is that thread? We, have, we, we share values, ethos, and, you know, beliefs, et cetera. But Africa is a thread between us. We're Black women. That culture is in our veins, regardless mm -hmm. how we work, our work ethic, how we raise our children, the kind of aunties we are. Africa gave us that damn foundation. So this thing is in our DNA. I don't think, you know, it's like, oh, Africa is going to be. Africa already is. And it really, Elizabeth, you sure you said it right. It's really down to us, really, to make it happen. I always use the coin trade, not aid. I hate the word aid. And in the same yes. sentence as Africa, it's in our hands. Yeah. We're doing it already. We just have to showcase. The women in five of the cover are doing amazing things in Africa in every shape or form. It's about us highlighting these things and putting it out there and saying, see what Africa is bringing to the world. Sorry, I'll shut up now. Fantastic. I, I feel like I don't need to be here. I can just let you talk. <laughs> we told you. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go back to one of the, the original points. So Elizabeth made a great point about embracing ourselves and Shalom early on touched on a key point regarding being more and more proud to shout about her African heritage. So I wanted to get everyone's opinions with regards to do you see yourself as British and African or do you tend to lean more towards one identity over the other? How dare you, Tessa? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> uh -uh now. Right, let me tell you, let me tell you the beauty of where we are is we can adjust depending on where we are. As as Shalom actually sort of says, it lives within us. It, it's very true. I find, <laughs> you know, when you go back home, and whether it's work, you know, right, you roll your sleeves so you take a deep breath, but there is a certain sort of, I don't know, you feel your soul, right? You know, it sort of just feels in, even though the person down the road is going, oh, my God, I'll come over here and getting on your nerves, right? You know, but, you know, there is there is something about that, right? You know, so I think it is a mixture. It is a mixture, certainly for me anyway, you know, um, where you dial up or you dial down, you know, depending on on where you are, but that sort of, I guess the mother Africa sort of sits in us. There are certain things in Africa I 100% do not agree with. <laughs> you know, when a man is telling me that I can't sit at the uh, entrance of a plane because I'm a woman, I'm kind of going, what are you going on about, right? So there's certain things that obviously it does need to kind of happen, right? Still in Africa, as, as, as we've definitely got to acknowledge that. As much as we're talking about the beauty of it, there are still certain things that need to move on. But British African, African British, depends on where I am. I just know that it's both. Fantastic. Thank you for that. It depends on which passport I'm holding. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm holding British, <laughs> British African, <laughs> if I'm holding my Nigerian passport. Shalom. You, Listen, you, know know you should try being me, walking down down in an airport with my passport, and the man's going, Madam, you're in the wrong line. You're in the wrong line. <laughs> 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 
But you raise a good point, though. Mm -hmm. It's that whole being accepted where you are. How are you seen where you are, depending on if you're in Africa or not, you know, whether you're here. For me, I think it's how I see myself. I'm tired of making it be how people see me and letting people define that for me. Because sometimes it can be tough. Elizabeth is right. You know, we're painting this rosy picture of Africa. It's also, like I mentioned, VUCA, but it's also challenging, particularly for us as women from a cultural perspective. You know, and I don't want to answer that question, Tessa, whether I'm British, African or African, British, because for me, it depends on where I am, depends on the situation, yes. depends on what kind of hustle I'm doing at the time. You know, so mm -hmm. for me, it's it's really about uh, when I look around and I think about five off the cuff, it's a sisterhood. And it's also us coming together and saying as women, we also do face challenges as women in Africa, as African women, when we go to Africa, we're facing different kinds of challenges, right? When we're here, outside of diaspora, we're also facing different kinds of challenges. So for me, it depends, really. Hmm. The women have nailed it. it. It just depends on where you are. So I'll be super honest. The minute I land in Harare Airport, I'm not going to lie, I am very Zimbabwean. The sounds, the smells, the irritations, you know, the language, everything just exudes. But the one thing that stays is because you have a slightly different twang in your accent now. So the minute you start speaking, they turn around and they say, what about England? Do you know what I mean? So you might identify yourself and embrace all those sights and sounds and everything. But the minute I land in that Zimbabwe, I feel, I don't want to say I feel at home, but equally, the minute I land in the United Kingdom at Heathrow, I feel at home as well. Because fortunately or unfortunately, I'm split half in the middle, British and Zimbabwean. The minute I land in both those locations, I feel at home. But there's something around just the sights and smells. You know, it just gives you that sense of, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you, Precious. I mean, when I went back for my brother's wedding, um, I think it was 2017 or 2018. And I hadn't been back to Nigeria for, for many, many years, you know, really before that. But actually landing and the sights and the smells and the feel and the language and the people, it felt so right. I mean, it just felt so right. And I was like, you know what? I need to come back every year. You know, I must have been just before COVID, actually, because then um, then COVID hit and I wasn't able to go back again for a while. And but I do want to go back. You know, I just love the feel. I, I went to Ghana in February. The same thing, you know, there's just a sense of belonging. OK, I think that for myself, actually working in a corporate environment, I find it really important that I bring my African self to work because, yes, you know, I'm British Nigerian or Nigerian British, whichever way round you want to put it. But when I walk into that office, you know, I want people to know that I am Nigerian. I want people to know that I am African. I want to be there to represent because there are not that many of us mm. in the organization, right? And there are not that many of us in senior positions. So it pays, I think, in the long run, particularly for people who are pulling up as you climb, um, to actually see you truly representing your authentic self in that environment. And for me, being that authentic self, for me, is being my Nigerian self in that environment. That doesn't mean to say that, you know, as you say, you kind of, you represent yourself slightly in different ways, depending on the context, depending on the client and all that. But ultimately, the true essence of it is me being my authentic Nigerian self. I love that. Fantastic. Thank you. So do you see the ability to adapt to different environments as a strength? And how would you say it's shaped you as women, mothers, businesswomen? Some people would define that as resilience. Agility. Agility. <laughs> I mean, I definitely, I think as women, regardless of whether we're um, African, you develop that. Then being um, black women, and having the heritage, you know, African heritage. So, yes, I think it's, as we have said in the past, when we've uh, been on a panel somewhere, that I think it's a superpower. You know, it doesn't mean that it should be code switching, because I think that's different. I think that's very different, because code switching is meaning that you're not kind of being your authentic self, right? So it's not about that. It's about actually being, having that skill to be able to adjust because you're in a different environment. But, but still being yourself, you know, because we have these layers. I was just thinking about actually what 
connect us or what made us um, particularly as as five of a cup made us particularly gel. And I think it is that African, you know, even though we're British and coming in with our you know, what the business is and all the stuff that we're talking, and we do a lot of stuff, you know, in our various sectors as well as being women leaders and being black women leaders and so on and then being black people and African and all that but I think I, I've never been more African ironically uh, you know um, apart from when uh, and, until when we've actually met up right you know so we meet up and we cook um African food I can't remember the last time I cooked a goosey soup to these people turned up you know, so <laughs> and, and I cooked it and it was had all of that sort of stuff in it because it just felt right, you know, and it's just amazing because the banter, the humor is off the chart, you know, and we just bring it in. And so there is something about that. So so uh, I, I don't know whether maybe some people might sort of say that that means that we kind of carry relax into it a bit more than maybe outside, who knows? But certainly I think having that superpower to show that, Agility and resilience is definitely a positive. I mean, I, I did um, used to work for an African company, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa. I didn't rock up there being all overly British in certain countries because I knew it wouldn't work. I thought, you know, it might be perceived as, you know, aloof or detached. I shifted gear to dial certain things up because it was it was a part of me that that was relevant at that point, whether it was Uganda or South Africa or Ghana or, or Nigeria. Right. And it was fine. You know, in fact, it was quite nice because well, I don't do enough of it. I agree, Liz, but I think we all share, not just us, but if you look at diaspora, different African people share the same narrative um, as a professional person or business person. I attribute a lot of my success to my parents. All of us can say the same thing. You had to go to university and get a degree. Education was your passport and your ticket out. And for those of us who have kids, you can see us doing the same thing to our children, right? That is Africa. Now, the value for money, the hard work, the resilience, the fact that all the five of us on this call can work 24-7 if we want to get something done is because you've seen opportunity. When you go back to Africa and see sometimes a level of poverty and the lack of opportunity, well, we have this opportunity, so we work extra hard for it. That is culture. That is Africa. Then there's the respect. As a mother, as a wife, my children are raised in a certain way where that culture is also embedded in them. It's the respect. I can't tell you how many times I get the feedback, oh, your children are so well behaved. And I'm like, what do you mean well behaved? It's how they're supposed to be. Don't give them any award for you know, <laughs> being nice and being good because that's how they're raised. That is an African, as Elizabeth is right, that is a thread really that ties us all together. We sit, we cook, we eat, we talk about really important things, we talk about nonsense, we talk about things that make us happy. And it spills over into your professional life because we do things with ease, in my opinion because we've grafted for it. So the output is normally done with ease and I love it. And that I, I can I can see my culture, Africa, in absolutely everything that I do. If my children want to say something, they change their accents. When we have, wow, wow now. You know, I was thinking, <laughs> why, okay, these children are really half African. You know, that's another thing, you know. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I just want to jump in here and just say, I don't know. I think I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't think it's as straightforward as that for me always. So straddling different cultures, different continents. I think trying to bridge the gap really between, and I I say gap, between Africa, between the diaspora, between the UK, between, you know, the Caribbean. So, you know, I'm straddling all those various different cultures. And all those various different cultures are a part of me. And so me having been in those various different continents, I've gained those experiences and that that insight. Trying to bring that to family, to children, is, again, something different because they haven't had the same experiences as I've had. So, you know, doing things like family reunions to get them to understand different cultures, to meet family, to get embedded in that there is a challenge there for for children, for, for my children, for our children, I think, you know, 
having that having different experiences and also engaging with other families like themselves as well living out in the diaspora so there's that 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 side of things I just throw that out there the other aspect is I believe that we all need to understand our own experiences of course yes but other black experiences and what I'm doing for that is bringing different people again from different parts of the world to engage engage in developing their business okay as founders but also uh, understanding that we all come from different backgrounds, different have different experiences, and we need to understand that. And we're not going to really be able to change things significantly if we don't understand that we come from different, have different black experiences and understand what those are so that we can bring about cultural change and actually make sure that we have the power to move forward economically. Um, so, yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, Elizabeth, that, that's so fascinating because one of the questions that came to my mind while you're talking is, do our children consider themselves as diaspora or is it just us? Yeah. <laughs> very, very important point. Yeah, well, they probably will consider that when they're in their 40s and 50s. and then <laughs> Because if you think about it, when you were growing up, were you considering yourself as in the diaspora or not. I mean, I think it's just a journey, isn't it? It's a becoming, that's a label, I think. Um, it's about how you feel. And Elizabeth's right, they're layers. They are layers, particularly if you have a mix in your family. My kids will actually say they're more British than African. Do you know what I mean? My kids will probably sort of be more, they're more UK than, than mm. African. As far as, you know, that's how I feel really. And I'm waiting to wait until they grow up. I, yeah, I, I think if, I think it's even earlier. Sorry, I, I think I need to check. I think it's even earlier. I'm having a narrative right now, a conversation with my daughter who's turning 16 in October. Mm. And she is really, really Impressive. interested and intrigued in mm. her mixed heritage. Her dad's mm. Ugandan, I'm Zimbabwean. She's British born. And she constantly is so hungry to know about Africa. She's so hungry. Just yesterday, she said to me, speak to me in Shona. Because I want to understand how to, I want to speak to you in Shona. Mm -hmm. Shona is my language. And so for me, I think that they are also struggling with the fact that, look, my mom speaks a different language when she's on the phone with her family. I hear her rambling along in Shona or in Develo or Kalama or Tswana or whatever it is. And then she listens to her dad speaking Luganda, Swahili, and then, and she's British born. And she's like, where am I? Mm -hmm. Who am I? She's hungry to be African. But you know what? She is African. Yeah, but, well, but I'm British. The struggle is already happening at 16. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the education system in the UK now, say, for example, um, where I suppose when we were kind of growing up, you know, born here, I was, I was born here in the UK and a, a lack of, I suppose, education, you know, in what happened in Africa or, you know, everything around Africa and all that sort of stuff. Right. Whereas now there is a, a light shone on that lack of awareness and education and in some schools they're actually now shining a light on it turn back go back to 2020 really which is really pushed that narrative along right where and everything else that's sort of happening with you know climate change you know with younger people kind of finding their voice in in ensuring that they are heard you know that whole kind of push of activism I suppose in the different areas and also a whole movement in the African identity right you know where younger people are actually embracing them as as black people you know as people from the continent as people from the Caribbean you know and, and so on so there is more of an awareness um, which was, I guess, maybe tucked away before. And there's more of a demand by the younger generations kind of go, hold on a second. What is my identity? You know how you sort of said, I'm British, but I'm African. What's happening here? I think it shouldn't be a but. I'm British and I'm African. So, but it's on us as parents to kind of ensure that we educate and show that we embrace it because we've come, we've got, our track has been different to the ones coming after us, right? So that they are armed, you know, and with what they need for, for them. I'm excited for, for them, really, to be honest. You know, look at the music. I mean, look at the music. Do you know, I was looking at the average age for uh, Africa's cross world, obviously it's different. It's 20, that, the medium 20. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just, you know, we're so young. So can you imagine what the future is going to hold for all of that? It's a wonderful thing. But I come back to this scramble of Africa. We need to make sure that we protect it. 
Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that the younger generation, you know, really coming through, I mean, it seems like, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, certainly for me, it seems like yesterday when we were that generation, right? I mean, so much has happened in the span of um, let's not count the years. But, <laughs> yes. um, but, but certainly, you know, they're not holding back. No. They're not taking no for an answer. I mean, even when it comes to working in a, in a corporate environment, they have demands. If your ESG is not up to scratch, you know, you don't speak to my values, right? So we talk about unlocking the potential of Africa. It's this generation coming through that are going to do it. Um, if you think about NSARS, if you think about, you know, just really just kind of like showing up. And as you say, the whole activism side of it, they really want to make sure that their voices are heard and they are prepared to take responsibility and be accountable for that. Um, a lot of the networks are springing up now, too. Um, there's one, I don't know if I can mention it really or not, which is really connecting, you know, black professionals globally, predominant in the UK um, and Europe and, and now moving into the US. I think it's networks, it's connections like that that are really going to serve to really be that dynamism and push to really unlock that true potential that, that Africa has. So I think it was either Shalom or, or Precious, I said earlier now, when I was talking about the partnerships and connecting together, it was Shalom, actually. It's happening now. You're so right. It is happening now. And there is still much we can do to unlock it even further. But we're, you know, we are getting there. So I don't think we're, you know, we're not sort of starting from a blank sheet of paper. And I think that this younger generation coming through, they're the ones that are really going to kind of like tip it to you know, get us to the summit. You know, I, I really believe it. Fantastic. So Edith touched on quite an important point there with regards to using networks and connections to unlock Africa's potential. So if we look at it, I guess, from a diaspora point of view, how can we as people from the African diaspora use our networks and connections to influence and shape the global narratives about Africa? We're doing it now. Your network is your net worth, right? I think we're doing it now. Just having five of the car forces women coming together, we're, we're already doing that. Um, as I mentioned before, all roads seem to lead to Africa for me, and I'm able to tap into any of these women for anything I need in Africa because they work in different sectors, know different people. And like we've said before, Africa is the next frontier. When you think about the UK Africa Summit, I mean, Tessa, you would know this, um, be it when it was Theresa Bay or when it was Boris or, or, or whoever, they've always known and seen that this potential in that African continent. So there's already eyes in Africa from a business perspective, like we said, the music, culture being exported. So a lot of eyes on it, a lot of people in our network now see us as key points of contact for Africa. And we also tap into each other. Your network is really, really important. And when we talk about being on ground, uh, for me anyway, is having reliable sources and people of their skills in Africa. People are skilled in my sector, healthcare professionals. My goodness, a lot of doctors who train in the Western world have all gone back to their countries to go and do their own thing. And that's the joy of a being diaspora. We find that a lot of people in diaspora go back. They go back, they set up their own thing, they're building skills, knowledge. So, you know, we're able to tap into those people as well who have gone back and who are able to keep doing what we're trying to do. And that's what lift Africa even further. I agree. And I think that there's a huge amount that is, I mean, where most people are fairly well networked. And even if you're not, I think it's our responsibility to introduce people to networks. So, you know, let people know what's prominent, what's visible, how they can make, how they can increase their connections, invite them to events, go to events yourself, sign up to these organizations. A lot of them are free. So some of them you do have to pay for, some of them, some of them you don't have to pay for you know, reach out to people on LinkedIn. I mean, they say if somebody posts something and you like it, make a comment as well, because then other people are going to see that you commented and that's, a, you know, people will reach out to you. It's a great way to really just establish further connections if you're looking to do that. And the voices are out there and they are being heard. So, you know, LinkedIn is a fantastic platform, but there are others. It's not the only one and it shouldn't be the only one. Um, we have to make ourselves present at the events. I think we have a responsibility to 
um, to attend the relevant, you know, networking, black events or African events or any other events. It doesn't even have to specifically be events within our community, but we have to make ourselves visible and um, ensure that we, we are introducing other people who perhaps don't have access to the same platforms that we do, that we make sure that they have the ability to really go out there and, and make those reaches themselves too. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, networking is super important. I think that if you work in a in a sales environment, which everything that each and every one of us is doing is linked to working in a in that sort of like sales commercial environment. So perhaps we're a little bit more practiced, you know, at doing that. Um, and I think it's probably our responsibility to kind of like help coach and guide people who are not necessarily, who don't necessarily have the experience that we do so that they can extend their network, you know, as I say, and get the introductions or rather benefit from the introductions that we can make, you know, really for them too. I've rambled, but I think yeah. you get the gist of what I'm saying. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, actually. And you yeah. touched on it at the, at the end when you were talking about you know, and you were alluding to almost like mentoring and coaching. And I think everybody around the table here has taken initiative. And the word that comes to, to mind is initiative. We have to initiate some of these things, mm-hmm. especially if we're in a position where we have had either been lifted up or peers have supported us or whatever it is. It is a, within our gift to set up initiatives and set up initiatives that also give opportunity for those that may be marginalized maybe by community, whatever it is, social standing or economic standing. The initiative is on ourselves. We need to take the initiative to do that. And part of that is creating spaces. You know, right now on this platform, on this podcast, we have created a space to talk about Africa, We've created a space to talk about how, what we're doing and how we're amplifying the voice of Africa. So I think the initiative is absolutely within our gift to implement. We have a master networker, Elizabeth Shaw. <laughs> I was going to go think from a different angle, actually. Uh, thanks for that. Because uh, just going back to what Shalom had mentioned about going back, and we need to really see and consider how to support individuals going back to Africa. It's challenging the same way that Africans are coming out to the diaspora and need that support. So, you know, yes, there was the um, year of return, Ghana 2019. And having had conversations with individuals, not just going back to Ghana, but different countries, Nigeria, different places, they faced lots of challenges. The fact is, yes, they may have been born there. Yes, they may understand uh, some of the cultural nuances, but you know, being out in the diaspora for such a long time and engaging in a different culture experience and going back, the challenges have been sometimes insurmountable. And in some cases, people leave again because they haven't been able to acculturate it within the society. So again, thinking about what we can bring, our connections, our networks, those that are already in those spaces, you mentioned spaces, opening up spaces, precious in those spaces to enable and support individuals that are going back. And also, we already have spaces where we're bringing people together from different parts of the world and understanding what's happening on the ground during those conversations, during those engagements is really key, which is why we're bringing people together that way. But also in that sense, you're already gaining access to networks, you're already gaining access to potential partnerships, you're already engaging potential suppliers and talent Uh, So there's some of the the challenges there, but I really just wanted to highlight that challenge, though, that it's challenging still, whether you are African or not, to go into Africa. You need to understand the culture. You need to have support systems. You need to have networks there as well. No, you're right. I'm going to Cannes this year. (laughs) <laughs> um, for uh, Can Lions, um, kind of lighten this up a bit, but you know, come on, we're sort of very, uh, yeah, getting um, too serious. <laughs> uh, yeah, gosh, it's certainly not the uh, the side that we. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, yeah, anyway, I'll move on from that. And uh, yeah, so I went last year, and uh, there was this whole sort of thing around sort of black at Can, basically, which in itself is quite remarkable. And so, so I'm going to count for the uh, Can Lion Festival on uh, for creatives, you know, so everyone in marketing, comms, creative, and so on, sort of descends on there globally. But what was quite remarkable. Because normally you kind of go and, you know, you generally really aren't the only one in the room, you know, right? But last year was unbelievable because you had literally people globally coming and descending on this place in 
the south of France, right? And it was the network that, that was then sort of born out of that of black people understanding that they needed to support each other, right? You know, within our, I suppose, sector. And this year is going to be even bigger. I'm literally walking down the promenade and see a black person that I don't know, um, who is not British, who would just not stop and will chat and then became part of the network, right? And there's a recognition that we needed to come together to support, and that's exactly what's happening. You know, so I think there is 100% power in it, as we all know, in the network, but also in leaning into the network, so that we're not just joining as passive observers taking and then doing our own thing but actually playing a part in however we can as well as as sort of Elizabeth said which is guiding those who need that helping hand to ensure that we you know when we're in which we are in as leaders that we don't pull up the ladder behind us that we ensure that others are in the room with us so that you know we're more comfortable sort of in that space you know as we help as for how we adjust when we go uh, when we look to move back or um, come back this way, the more of us that are in that space or the more we can build the network within the spaces, let's say if we are going back to Ghana or Nigeria or, or wherever, then I guess the more relatable and more comfortable it becomes. You know, So we can't be on this side just talking. We need to be, I think, present in the spaces as well to kind of help, I think. Otherwise, it's not completely authentic. During the conversation, we've touched on some of the key activities and trends that we can see currently taking place inside and outside Africa. And we are all in agreement that Africa's time is now and the future. So if we look forward into the next five years, how do you see Africans in the diaspora, you know, people like yourselves making a positive contribution to the evolving power of Africa? It's definitely about coming together. Um, I think one of the questions that you had before, which we didn't touch on, was you know what's your kind of what's your favourite African proverb? And um, you know, and, and mine mine is, and I don't know. I think it's from Bukuna Faso. I think, which is, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Yes, I think that's, and that is just. That, I think, hits the nail on the head, you know, really for me when it comes to where we want to be in five, where we want to be in five years time. We have to come together as a collective. Um, going back to my point earlier, which was about the whole collaboration or partnerships between the diaspora and on the continent. We have to find a way for that to be even more joined up and we're getting there. Maybe not quite there yet, but we are absolutely getting there. If we can find that path to actually come together, we will go so far. And, you know, looking at five years, 10 years, you know, really from now, my, my, my vision, my vision would be that there is that, un- that we are that unified force to be reckoned with because we are almost there. In fact, we're, we're literally on the precipice of it. So, yeah, for me, it's about just making sure that we get that collective, that we are joining forces and we're finding opportunities also where we can partner with each other in the UK or in the diaspora um, in order to enable that partnership with the local communities on the continent to to foster and, and work better. For me, it's about the journey, even just this journey that we're taking as five off the cuff. I don't want to say, you know, in five years, 10 years time. For me, it's about the journey, what we're doing now to get, you know, to keep improving things. You know, I look around, it's, like I said, it's a sisterhood. We have here a strong network. You have resources here in five women, a collection of views, a collection of sectors and businesses. We're African, we're women, we're African women. We, we drink together, we eat together, we laugh together, we cry together. Um, we talk about current topics, right? We talk about taboo topics. We learn, we educate, we raise each other, we raise children, we network, we grow businesses, we do podcasts, you know, we do speaking engagements, uh, we strategize bringing five different perspectives. We have fun because life is too short and it's a great time to be an African woman, right? Um, you know, we, we kind of normally say we're not this, you know, serious 
but it, it, it is. It, <laughs> we're really not. And I just said our be... best behavior for you, Tessa. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to behave around me. We don't want to scare the audience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, so for me, not to your question, really, following up, I agree with what Edith said, but it's really, I look closer to home because it's my fuel right now. It's it's my plug-in. And I think if that bit is okay, ah, then the future's bright. Mm. I think I'll just add on to what these lovely ladies have said. You know, following on with the African proverb to segue into what I'd see the next five years being. For me, there's a statement that's said in South Africa about Ubuntu. You know, yes. we are. Yes. We, I am what I am because of who we all are. Yes, 100%. you know, there's something around that. There's unification. So we talked about Edith is talking about us being connected. Shalom's talking about you know our journeys, bringing it back home. But actually, to bring Africa to push it, it's really about the rest of the world, including Africa, understanding that we are who we are because of all of us. Mm-hmm. So now there's a challenge. Now are we actually? pushing that Ubuntu agenda, humanity to mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. Because if we start doing that as a collective, really the I mean the I world love is that. Just, I I love mean, that. Yeah. You know, so that's me. Yeah, no, I, I love Chino Achebe, you know, and there's so many sort of quotes that he has, you know, um, but there's one that really sort of stands out for me. Um, well amongst many to be honest with you. And when he sort of says um until the lions had their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And that really is about us uh, not having our story dictated or told with a certain lens and not controlling and dictating and telling our own narrative, right? Our own story. Basically, you know, when there's this whole sort of thing about we want a seat at the table, right? Which tends to be banded out a lot. It's more about us creating our own table. It's our own table and then inviting those to take a seat at our table, our narrative, our story, and how we then dictate it moving forward. Because if we sit there um, dancing to the tune of somebody else's, Africa will always be looked at through a lens that is not our lens, you know. So we need to pick up the camera and look through our lens and dictate our story. That's the only way we can kind of move forward, I feel, you know, and have that, I guess, um, courage and Africanness, I suppose, that nobility, that pride to now tell our own story. I'm just going to say everything that our ladies here have mentioned. Yeah, we need to live by, right? We need to live by that. And um, we've gone through many lessons to live by. I think something that's really crucial for us is, again, about togetherness, is about collaboration, is about how we are accountable for our actions and how we can have fun together. I think that that's, I love, I love what uh, Shola mentioned there about us all coming together to have fun. Um, so for me, yeah. I think that that's uh, essentially it. in five years time, I want to ensure I think that uh, things have changed in Africa in as much as uh, we are investing in ourselves. Um, investing in ourselves is key, important. Um, the I am coming into it again from a startup landscape, uh, investment landscape, that the majority of funding is uh, invariably white. Um, and we want to ensure that um, that changes so that we invest in ourselves. And it's not about aid. It's about the fact that we are fantastic, talented individuals um, that really have tremendous, tremendous potential. Um, and we want to ensure that our community, our, our continent continues to grow with our own investment. Quote of the week. As people, we often have quotes, mantras, African proverbs or affirmations that keep us going when times are good or when times are hard. Do you have one that you can share with us today? Well, my one then really is, if you don't like someone's story, write your own. Your story is what you have, what you will always have. It is something to own. Yeah. Yes. Love that. That's great. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. So as we're coming to the close of today's conversation, it's been a fantastic conversation. Do you have any closing remarks, any final calls to action for people who are interested in Five Off The Cuff and the great work that you're doing? 
Absolutely. Like Edith said, when we started this conversation, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, if you want to hear laughter, if you want to engage with us, you know, in conversation, in whatever it is, keep your eyes peeled five off the cuff. We've been a bit behaved today, but we don't normally like this. It's <laughs> good. You know, we're just showing we're just showing that we could be professional. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, connect with us. You know, we do a lot in our space, mentoring wise, giving back, paying it forward, as well as in our respective areas as women leaders, you know. And so whether it is help supporting those who are coming up or those who are already here who need that support because we still need it. The fact that we are not necessarily rising stars doesn't mean that we still aren't rising. You know, so we support our own as mums, as women, as black women, as black people in industry and as Africans and as British and being part of the African diaspora. So, yeah, you know, we'll continue to talk and elevate. And, um, yeah, we want uh, people to kind of join us in that cause what a way to close today's conversation and all your details i will put on the show notes of the podcast if you don't mind so people can get in touch with you definitely yeah so it's been an absolute pleasure thank you for having us on so yeah i mean that's been a great conversation you know having the ability to get the perspective of five different people in terms of viewpoints on african and british heritage culture and business so i love what you ladies are doing it's unique it's fresh it's different and you are great ambassadors for africa and the diaspora so well done brilliant keep it up Thank you, Tessa. Thank you. Take care, Tessa. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share, or tell a friend about it. You can also rate, review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast. Thank you and see you next week for the Unlocking Africa podcast. 